Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another webinar series. In this, this time, we're going to be actually answering some of the Q&A questions that were um, left on our sample preparation uh, webinar. By the way, thank you so much for those. So hopefully, I answer them properly, and you guys can have fun with them. Okay, screen's a little slow, I guess. So here are the list of questions that were given to me on um, that day. So the first one being, what techniques do you use for microscopy of polymers? I'm not going to read them all. I I put them all on each on each slide, so we'll go through them. So for question one, what technique do you use for micro for microscopy of polymers and polymer composites? What techniques do you use for ceramic powders? Um, I know this seems like multiple questions, but I wanted to make sure that I got them in the same because they sort of follow the same preparation steps. So the answer to this question is we can use regular grinding and polishing steps, but at lower forces. Um, and we want to use special clots. By special clots, as I mentioned on the webinar before, um, you want to do a little bit of background research on your sample so that you use the proper cloth for that proper application. In this case, you want to use cloths that are much softer that will not have the, um, what we call is those debris sort of um, top to them so that they don't scratch the surface of the polymer too much. Um, but also you can use microtomy as well to, to prepare a sample uh, polymer based, especially for TEM, you, you're definitely gonna have to use microtomy. For, cut, for cutting and sectioning, you wanna use softer blades. Um, something like aluminum oxide would be okay in terms of uh, cutting material for, for a polymer. Um, and you want to use, I would recommend using an oil-based lubricant um, for, for polymers, only because I know some alcohols might influence plastics a, a little bit aggressively, especially acetone. So please make sure you don't use acetone when you're working with your polymers. Um, one tip that I can give is if when you're preparing loose powders, um, you can use the SEM uh, loose powder method that I mentioned over at the webinar. Um, just a lower intensity, so instead of using maybe 4 kV, we're talking about 2 kV, maybe even 1.5 kV. Um, the downside is um, you will have to play around with the intensities a lot, especially because of the curtaining effect that will show up in your polymer. And as I mentioned before, for some samples, um, you know, you want a mask, okay? And if you're preparing a polymer, in the cross-sectional polisher, you're gonna definitely have to use a mask. Now, you'll have to do a lot of, a lot of uh, background research before you want to put your polymer into an e-beam um, cross-sectional polisher just to make sure that you're not just gonna ruin your sample completely, okay? Um, some polymers are very tricky to prepare and they can easily be damaged, okay? So I recommend if you're on a time, on a very tight time schedule, um, use a fib, or try and see if you can wedge polish your polymer. Um, they're really tough, okay? Uh, you'll probably be spending, if you're doing wedge polishing or the fib, you're probably spending half a day um, just, to, just to polish the sample, okay? Second question, what is microtomy? Great, great segue from the first question. So it's very common in TEM, okay? But also, also it can be used on SEM, as I mentioned. It involves cutting and sectioning small pieces of the sample, which may be embedded in a carrier medium. So for example, they can be carried in glass or, or a plastic. Um, and what it uses to cut, it usually involves a very sharp glass based or, or diamond. Um, it either slices, either the slices or the actual slice piece can be examined, as I mentioned earlier, um, or the block phase, which is exposed, which is what I just said. Um, more in the SEM common, but former done also, especially when using SEM transmitting. Okay. Um, mostly used in polymers or soft materials. Okay. You can also use microtomy for uh, materials like aluminum and to make thin sections of very soft materials, right? Um, thin sandwich sections you can also do, okay, which can be embedded in, in resin. Okay. Um, usually it's done on standard biological preparation. And it's usually very uncommon in, in terms of material science. So that's why I mentioned it's usually mostly done for standard biological sample preparation here. Um, 
Cryo microtomy is basically microtomy, but done at very, very low temperatures. This is done just to make sure that the um, sample doesn't lose any of its um, sample integrity. So we want to make sure that the sample maintains extremely intact. Okay, and this is just microtomy continued. So this is a visual of how microtomy works. So what will happen is the blood will come in, slice the thin cross section of the sample. Step two, right? We would draw, and then there's our section for SEM. We would study this area here for TEM, the tiny section here. Okay. Question three: What is the typical thickness of a coating? Let's say you want to do gold palladium. How do we measure the thickness? Now, as I mentioned before, usually coders these days have a thickness monitor to them. Um, but just in case you want to give yourself a little background of why we code, we usually code based on application and granularity, as I mentioned on my webinar. So I have a couple of images here again, just to show you the purpose, right? And what coding material we want to use for this for this purpose. Now, like I mentioned before, usually we code anything from carbon, gold, gold, palladium, platinum, and, and silver for secondary and backscatter imaging. Carbon and chromium, which are, we need about, you know, 100,000 times magnification and the particle size need to be small enough for us to not be able to see the coding, right? So carbon and chromium, as you can see on the table here, we sort of get into the platinum chromium range. And if you want to do elemental analysis, we're looking at carbon, aluminum, or gold. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about why we want to pick between the elemental analysis bases when we're doing a coding. Okay. So usually new coders, like I said, they, they usually have a, um, a monitor to them to measure the thickness, but coatings should usually be small enough to retain the features. Right, anything from five to ten nanometers. Now, this can vary. Um, some people like to make the the coating a little thicker for thermal um, help. Right, you don't want to heat up your sample too much. The coating will help us out with that. Um, should always be done for non-conductive samples, as I already mentioned. Um, and thermal conductivity is increased, right, which reduces the beam the beam damage, like I mentioned and also increases the secondary and backscatter signals, which we need so much for SEM and TEM, okay? Coding the samples also helps with image controls, which helps for electron charging and image distortions that are caused from the beams and or all our lenses in our, in our microscopes, okay? Tips, whenever not sure about what coding will work for you, okay, I would recommend testing a coding at your lab. So grab the sample or grab uh, a material that's similar to that one, give it a light code with whatever material you want, put it in the SEM, see if it works out for you. But all, but if you're doing elemental analysis, you have to keep a, a couple of other things in mind, okay? If you just want to get rid of the charging, you can do this, but if you're doing elemental analysis, you have to consider the coding and the element to a little bit more depth, okay? Which is amazing what the fourth question is about. So while uh, the question says, metal coating is often used for SEM sample preparation. How do we make sure that the sample metal interface is not changed by using the metal and not, and not affect this microscopy, which is EDF, which is the elemental analysis that I was talking about, okay? So the most common sample coating material is carbon, as we know. Since carbon is everywhere, we use the same element to hide out the signal in EDS, okay? So that's the answer. This is, this is because carbon is such an element and is mostly transparent to the electron beam. So there's very little interaction, right? Few carbon X-rays are generated and it causes very little electron scattering. The fact that carbon is common element is actually a downside sometimes of using carbon as a coating because you can't characterize the amount of carbon in the sample. So you have to be really careful if you are looking for carbon in your sample, you have to make sure that you look for other ways aside from carbon, right? Um, in cases that it might be better, in other cases, it might be better to use platinum or, or aluminum because they're also very light elements, okay? Um, as long as the sample doesn't have those elements already, you can obviously look for them. Um, for heavy coatings, elements like gold, since it's a different element that will show up, it's, not, it's, it's bad because of its high atomic number and it can stop 
um, other electrons from reaching the sample, or it can block other interactions due to its volume depth. Other than, unlike carbon, right, um, gold produces a lot of x-rays, right, which will probably lower the yield for us, okay? Um, but a gold, will, but other, but good things about gold is it will also help us with SE signals and it's better for conductive properties, okay? So usually when we're, when we're thinking about a coating, to summarize this, this answer here, is we sort of look for trade-offs between the coatings, right? If I'm looking for carbon, I'm gonna have to look outside of carbon, right? If I'm doing that EDS analysis, if I'm looking for another light element, I might consider aluminum or platinum or chromium. And if you're looking for something that will help with charging and conductive properties, gold is your way to go. Question five, what are the worst sources of contamination in sample preparation? And this is a great question. It's a very small question, but it's a great question because um, most of the issues with sample preparation tend to be contamination. And a good, uh, good way to understanding them is to make sure that, that we sort of are able to eliminate where these contamination issues are coming from. Okay, so I have three main ones. So usually not changing the polishing cloth is the worst. Um, so, for example, if I have a six micron cloth for a zirconium and a six micron cloth for a steel, I don't want to mix the two. Okay. Um, zirconium is a lot harder to prepare than steel. The contaminants for them, zirconium, are definitely going to scratch your surface on your steel. So, I try to separate my cloths according to material a lot of times. So, I recommend doing the same. Um, not cleaning after every grinding step. As I mentioned before, it is a good idea to make sure that you have cleaning baths and that you do a lot of extra cleaning steps to make sure that if you are going to get to those those uh, slurry steps as I mentioned earlier those mirror finishing steps you have to be very very clean okay um, using other people's equipment right other people may not be as clean as you and uh, take it from my personal experience sometimes you know you use the same equipment as other people they might not be as clean as you so make sure that you keep in mind that maybe doing an extra bit of um lab work in terms of you know preparing the cleaning area uh, preparing the area cleaning the area before you start your preparation is also important um and just the tips right to to refer to make sure that i rephrase and and re-emphasize you know the ultrasonic cleaning bath on alcohols between every grinding step is a lifesaver for me is usually what i do to make sure that even if you have those contaminants on your cloths you're getting rid of them you know by taking this extra step as um, as you go through your grinding steps, okay? And also make sure that you check your sample in the light microscope. You won't see how useful this, this little step is until you start to really use it, okay? So I really recommend everyone to make sure that, uh, that you check the sample in the light microscope. Um, question number six, when grinding and polishing polymer samples, do they, they tend to get gummy, which is, which is a good, good thing to bring up. If so, what techniques do you use to combat this? Um, usually they tend to become gummy after a certain thickness. So usually after about 200 microns, they tend to, to pretty much disappear. If you're looking to prepare something thinner than about 200 microns, um, you're looking to, to maybe go into the fib or, or a special machine like the web polisher to, to prepare the samples in. Um, but a lot of the times, start to see gumminess as well when using alcohols. Um, so I recommend using lubricant-based um, solvents when grinding and polishing, okay? Just, just to make sure that you don't change the, the surface of your polymer, okay? Thermoplastics, therm, thermoplastics can be difficult to polish um, because it can smear off the surface, okay? So polishing works very well with cross-linked polymers. So as long as you're really careful um, about cascading down in grades when polishing and your paste, let's say you're using the wedge polisher, you'll probably be using paste and cleaning very, very well as you go through your grades and using the ultrasonic bath tip that I've given you, then you, sh you should be okay with uh, preparing your polymers. And again, if you are looking to prepare your polymers in, in the cross-sectional polymer using the cross-sectional polisher method that I, that I recommended on the webinar, you'll have to take a couple of temperature precautions 
before you can get your polymer in there. Um, and a couple of other tips, um, they can be really tricky due to the morphology and they can be very easily. So it's important that you look at other options to save time, okay? So if you can get your sample fibbed, that, that is very, very um, useful to do and it's very, very quick. Um, so if you're having a lot of trouble with polymers, there's no really way, there's no really good way around it. If you're experiencing a lot of this gumminess, is you might have to consider something gentler like um, dimple grinding, wedge polishing, or the fib. Okay. And again, using the light microscope just to see how the polymer is behaving on the first few uh, grinding steps or polishing steps will save you a lot of time and a lot of work because you'll know exactly how the, the polymer is behaving and if it's going to be too, too gentle or if it's going to require a lot of extra work. Here are some grinding and polishing equipment that I mentioned before. Sorry about that. Computer's going. So just to make sure that, I, so you want to use these in accordance to whatever material you want. The wedge polisher is the one I recommend the most when you're working with, um, with polymers because it gives you a nice, gentle, and it's very controlled environment. Um, and the vibratory polisher as well, you can use that as your last finishing step and it will give you a beautiful mirror finish on any, on any material that you want, as long as you as you pick the correct cloth, of course. Um, question seven, is there a way to wafer brittle materials for TM sample preparation? Yes, um, I'm not gonna go into details on how to do it because there's a very good link out there that I use myself to prepare um, these wafer brittle samples, and I've written the link here, okay? And here's the appropriate uh, nom um, nominee, I would say, mentions, okay? So go ahead and check that link out. It actually gives information about how to prepare TM samples in, in, in multiple ways, not just um, the brittle wafer way. It, we also have sandwich for uh, dimple grinding, it has general dimple grinding. It has, uh, I think, a section on um, iron milling, and it has a section on, uh, it's, it's just an overall very good link for uh, TM preparation. Um, question eight, for a lot of cleaning, you mentioned using the ultrasonic bath. Yes, extremely important. What would you recommend as an alternative if the, if the method isn't suitable for your material? This is a good question because sometimes, right, you can't, pull your sample through the ultrasonic. Let's say you had nano bonding on your material. You might not be able to, to get it in the ultrasonic bath because you might break the bondage. Um, so I would just recommend just multiple rinses then in certain alcohols and, and maybe a gentle blow dry are good ways of cleaning it. Um, and also maybe placing your sample in a vacuum chamber where you'll be able to add a little bit of heat, so like a like a vacuum oven that will not be too aggressive on your sample. Um, you might have to do a little bit of research to see, you know, how hot you can get in the oven. But again, usually if I'm running into trouble with with cleaning the sample, uh, I try to just rinse it as much as you as I can, and then placing it in a vacuum just to make sure that I can get rid of those that extra bit of of uh, oils that I left off in in, in the surface. Okay. There's also very good plasma cleaners out there that you can use um, on the surface of the samples or on just the general area that you need to investigate. Um, that, would, that is all for all the questions for the webinar. Here are some references that I've used to, to help me answer these questions today. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next webinar with everyone. So thank you so much for your time.